Hey, welcome to Modern Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're back. We're, uh, oh, I should have done Just that. Just the two of us. <laughs> Live in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Oh. I was sweating today. You I were? Went to a, I went to a spin class. Oh, okay. Ooh. I spun out. You spun out? Yeah. Well, happy Thanksgiving, James. I mean, this is coming out after Thanksgiving, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know. Are you doing anything fun for Thanksgiving? I'm just going home. Okay. Yeah, cool. what about you? I'm going to go to the girlfriend's family. Oh, nice. Down in Maryland, so that'll be that'll be fun. Yeah. Don't drink too much. So, <laughs> I'll be on my best behavior. I'm sure you will be. I'm sure you'll be quite the gentleman. Um, but yeah, what we haven't had any done any updates in a long time. Well, we've been doing a lot of interviews lately. I hope you guys have yeah. enjoyed them. Yeah. I think we haven't done a you and I podcast for a while, right? When's the last we time did we did one, one for the core conference? Uh, yeah. yeah, that was that was still a while back. Yeah, but what's what's been going on, Nick? Um, uh, I got a confession, James. I haven't told you, but over the past month, I have purchased approximately three hype items. What? And I think I might become <laughs> be becoming a hype beast. Oh <gasps> no! <laughs> Get out the supreme cage. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know how we always like to talk about uh, our our uh, interest into hype culture. And, well, I've started to dabble a little bit, and I don't know how I feel about it. But let me just <laughs> let me just tell you. Let me just tell you a few of the things that I, I have now. This is all Emily's fault, isn't it? It is. It is. It is. Oh, my god. Yeah, my gosh. girlfriend uh, is way more. Are you into, ready for way, hypes giving? <laughs> hypes giving. Oh, man. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I guess a month ago or so, Emily went to this hype fest thing where it's like, it's like a big festival where all the hype beasts go and they buy hype things Yes, and they do hype things. I don't know what those <laughs> things are, but you know, they do that. Um, and she, to- you know, was telling me about it and she said, oh, and there was also a booth where you can buy Pokemon hype things like Pokemon hype collaborations which you know is, mm. is a very uh, niche market yeah but the fun thing about it was that you had to be a level 25 pokemon go player in order to purchase anything so you had to work for it what level are you nick 26 oh <laughs> so uh, emily told me this and i'm like oh we have to go back and uh she was gracious enough to just go and get it for me so oh my god so I, I, I just logged into my uh, pokemon go account on her phone and she got the uh, oh, we got a t-shirt and it has it's actually kind of cool. It's really minimal, and it just says like Pokemon, and I think Fragment is the brand. Mm. It's like some Japanese clothing brand. Okay. Um, definitely the most expensive shirt I've ever bought. It was fifty dollars. Yeah. Uh, which you know, for you, I know that's like cheap. You know, you're that's chump change. <laughs> uh, living up in your high house with the the fireman's pole, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was interesting, and then I also. Uh, got the NASA Vans collaboration recently. I don't know if you saw those or not. Yeah. I actually have them right here. Oh, my God. He's flexing, everybody. He's about to flex on you. Man. So I got to say, you know, the first one was kind of like an impulse buy. You know, that T-shirt Pokemon thing was just like, I feel like I deserve it because I'm level 25 at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one is... uh, Let me touch it. it, it, They are the Vans. They're just classic Vans shoes. They're white. They're... Uh, leather and they had a collaboration with nasa so on the side it has it says nasa has a logo and it says like what does it say kennedy space center or something it says national aeronautics and space administration john f kennedy space center and it's really nice it's like minimal but has these subtle cues and this is my favorite part james just ripped off a velcro american flag that sticks on the back Okay, I can't drop that on the ground. We'll have to bury it. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, this why is this cut yeah, like this? And that's interesting too. I don't know why there's this trend of having exposed foam padding on the on clothing and shoes. Hmm. I know there's like uh, other hype it, shoes have is that. Is it off, is an off-white trend? I think so, right? Yeah. 
So yeah, around the mouth, around the mouth of the shoe. I, is this what you call the mouth? The, I don't know. The opening where, you, where you slip your foot in. Shoe anatomy. Me either. Um, but uh, <laughs> welcome to my details. The podcast for two guys <laughs> don't know anything about shoes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's cut open so that there's just this foam exposed around the mouth, the the foot opening right. mouth. But um, yeah, I I saw those shoes and I was like, whoa, oh, this is like blueprints a, in here. This is a hype item that I just want because it looks cool. Like whether it's hype or not, I just was gonna get it because it's awesome. For the benefit of all, yeah. imprinted on the side mm-hmm. of the uh, of the sole. So, anyways, I just thought that was mm, interesting. Oh, that's cool. Oh, and then the other hype. Thing oh that my I gosh! Got. So, so we have a mutual friend, or I I guess I just recently met him, uh, Chris Crowley. Yeah. And he is the designer, uh, or one of the industrial designers at Visibility. Yeah. Um, little Curbside. Little Curbside is his Instagram handle. Yeah. And he does some really interesting illustrations. Amazing work. Check him out. Right. But he started this thing called Stolen Item. Yes. And uh, he just had a release party uh, like this weekend. Right. For his, the, what they are, they're tags. They're just like plastic tags. Like luggage tags, right? Is right. that is that what they are? Well, I, I actually think that, I'm, I'm grabbing it right now. So I actually think that they are used in police departments. Mm. Where, you know, they have to like catalog stolen items oh. from crime. And they just oh. put these like plastic tags and they write on the back like, hey, stolen TV, you know? Yeah. Whatever. Oh, uh-oh. I dropped one. But yeah, it's a it's it's an interesting thing because he just made these tags as a school project. I think he did it in school. I uh, know. I think it was out of school. It was out of school. I think, I think w- um, if I have the story straight, and maybe we'll have to get him on the pod to yeah. tell us the whole tale. But I think he was in China for a project while he was working at Frog, <laughs> and he he might have seen these in a factory or realized that he could just like, you know print yeah because they're super print simple onto these right they're super simple yeah uh oh man i mean you know me love that loop <laughs> it's <laughs> right it has a loop you can loop it on anything and, and but the, he's broken into hype culture and so i, I got to meet him i yeah. actually hadn't met him before until the party and it, it's kind of funny i i would love to like again i mean we should get him on the pod but um it's almost a i see it as kind of a critique mm-hmm. on hype culture itself yeah like having these stolen tags and most people put it on like a bag or like you know their belt right and you know it seems like oh you stole the item because people that are in hype culture i would argue that a lot of the like big brands that everyone wants are really expensive right you know people might steal those things or maybe like people will buy things and then take a picture and return it right so it's almost like a little bit of a critique on the culture in a way but yeah the culture accepted it as i don't know i think it's kind of ironic and i really kind of like it it's fun yeah it's great he's got a couple different tags that that say some some different things on them but this is the original the stolen item and it's the uh yellow and black tag we'll have to uh put a picture of it up on the uh on the website yeah um that's cool i've got a little low-key hype this is this is deep deep hype this is design hype i've got i've got that go hobo hat on it's camo it has that h with the little degree symbol i won this from huang uh one half of creative sessions amazing design group yes Um, design brothers i uh i entered into a raffle by posting a comment and i happened to be one of two people to win a hat. Um, and yeah, every time I put it on, you know, you know how like people put on Jordans, they put it back, put on Jordans back in the day and it was like, it'll make you run faster, jump <laughs> higher. This will make you design better. Yeah. It'll make me sketch faster and better. And you know, um, so funny. yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to channel a much more talented designer than myself today. So we got, we got, we got things to do. We yeah. got questions to answer. Um, but I guess before then, uh, Oh, Hey, you've been, yeah, you've been doing stuff. I've been doing some things. Yeah. What have you been, yeah, I've been out and out and about, uh, I've, yeah, I've kind of, I haven't posted on Instagram in a while, but cause I've been posting stories about, I did a, a Skype call with ASU, 
uh, Arizona State University, right? Okay. Okay. And then well, uh, Arizona, not Appalachia. Uh, I Arizona. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then I also went out and visited NJIT. Um, cool. And this, was it fun? Would you would you do? You did yeah, the, sketch demos or the, just... the ASU thing was was kind of a QA and then a, a little bit of sketching. I didn't want to do a full sketch demo over Skype because mm. you know, it's just like especially the demo that I like to do, I like it to be a bit more interactive. Right. Um and uh you know, but they were great and like listen to me ramble for an hour about like my entire career i think i'm sure you had some great things to say hopefully hopefully um i actually accidentally so so a guy that we met at uh at square one uh let me see if i can pull him up oh my gosh i i i said his name wrong talented mr ripley yeah yeah why can't why why isn't it showing up oh my gosh this is the worst search engine oh, go up i saw it did you yeah the oh, oh go up. there it is so i so when he walked in i saw him walk in on the skype okay this is this is henry ripley henry ripley mm-hmm. and i said oh hey tom well, why'd you say tom because in the movie talented mr ripley oh that's a movie yeah. See, that's why I would have been on it. Oh yeah, you I don't would. Know movies. Yeah, this is this is where pop culture bites me in the butt. Oh. Um. So I call him Tom, and the whole room erupts in laughter, and I'm like, <laughs> Oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> so I, I ran off screen to go grab some things, but I also grabbed my iPad, and as I was talking, I looked him up, and I was like, Sorry, Henry. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize. But uh, but he said his uh, his classmates are going to be calling him Tom for the rest of his <laughs> oh, no. time at school. Oh man, that's well, what you get. I also will say like <laughs> the name thing. I'm horrible at names too. I, oh I, god, it's like one of the. Oh, it's so hard. Well, now there's this extra layer of not only knowing somebody's name but also associating them with their handle right. and like right. you know. So when you meet people at conferences, it's like. You, you're you like... Like the first time I walked up to you, I couldn't remember your name. I just said, hey, what's up, receipts? <laughs> first name I draw. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's it's this whole tricky thing in the 21st century with handles. Um, but yeah, uh, and then the, the night that I went out to NJIT was the night of the snowstorm. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, we had some snow here. In New yeah. York. So I, I took a train out. And then... And and uh, never, never came back. This is actually the ghost of of James Connors. Or is this a hologram? Yeah, no, it's it's a ghost. I'm dead. Am I in VR? Yes. <laughs> Nick, take off your glasses. Um, yeah, I uh, I went at, like I went out. The snow had just started. I went out on a train on an Amtrak train to Newark. They actually have this great subway system over there, the light rail, which was super easy to take to NJIT. And um, really want to thank everybody from the NJIT IDSA who brought me out there and I got to do my sketch on the fly demo. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hung out for a little bit, ate some pizza. It was great. That's awesome. And, um, but then my way back, like I bought a train ticket and as soon as I bought the train ticket, it was like your eight o'clock train will now be leaving at nine o'clock. And mm. I was like, mm, oh, that, no. That's always bad. It oh, starts getting no. delayed. It starts getting delayed. But luckily, the PATH train was still was still running smoothly, okay. which is surprising. So you got home. So I got home. That's I got great. home fine, um, unscathed. But anyway, Nick, let's get down to business. Well, one, one quick other announcement. Okay. Um, a quick one. We Make are, it quick. We, <laughs> Quickly, Nick. Uh, we are looking for feedback on the podcast. Right. And... Uh, James and I have created a Google form to uh, send to you guys, and I am giving away one of my Ben Mears to to um, anyone. Well, to one of the Ben Mears will go to someone who s- submits to the survey. Mm. So yeah, you have a chance to win a Ben Mear. Yeah, and a free massage from James. Is that what you're giving away? <laughs> from my feet. <laughs> um. So yeah. Uh, We'll post that in the MeyerDetailsPodcast.com um, and probably put it in the stories, in our stories, so that you guys can swipe up and easily get to it. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, look for that because you got to get that free stuff, you know? Yeah, and we, we'd love to hear what you guys have to say because, you know, just like any other design project, this is an iterative process. We're sure. trying to trying to figure out how best to deliver the content. Yeah. Try what to, you guys want. Try to keep up in the game too. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, as we've been going going through and, and making episode after episode, we've left some questions behind. Yeah, we have not answered questions in several episodes. Yes. And so we feel like it's time. Today is an all questions episode. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, keep your fingers crossed. You may be <laughs> answered. Oh, no. You're going to make either. There's that one person that's just sitting there and <laughs> fingers crossed the whole episode and it's never going to happen. For them. Yeah. And that's how we get people to listen to the end, Nick. Also, yeah, we, we do appreciate everyone sending in questions. If you have a question, send it to minor details podcast at gmail.com. And, you know, we, we dug through. I know there's a lot of backlog. Um, so, you know, we, we pulled up a bunch here. I also, I feel like I've seen a few questions come through on the Instagram DMs, but they're long gone. Like, yeah. if you guys want to get a question read, you got to send it to the, the Gmail because that's what, that's what we check when we do the episodes. Yeah. Um, but without further ado, mm-hmm. and let's get to this first question let's here. Let's do it. Uh, this one is from Eric Bottleson. Mm. And they say, I'm going into my last semester at Virginia Tech. What up? And I need to decide what my thesis project is. One of my current favorites is to design a handlebar for a mountain bike. However, that would put two bike projects into my four project portfolio. Mm. And while I want to work in the bike industry, I'm afraid that I will be stuck because my portfolio won't be diverse, diverse enough. I was just wondering if you all had any advice or suggestions. Hmm. I mean, first of all, my my first question is, can you do an entire thesis project on a handlebar? Sure. I guess for me, it feels like... You should do the whole bike. It's a one semester project. I mean, at the end of a one semester project where you're focusing on a specific component, I would would want to see like some pretty nice prototypes at the end of it. You know, some pretty nice looking, you know, if you're focusing on a specific component. I mean, I think obviously you could, you could expand the project to be a full bike and that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a lot of work. That is a lot of work, but you can also, you know, kind of silo the project to be one element and really design that element to be innovative or, you know, really craft all the details. Yeah. I mean, that would be pretty cool. But in terms of pigeonholing. Have you ever thought about this? pigeonholing yeah i mean that's what i thought about my entire time when i was at uh you know my first job i was the kitchen stuff yes i feared being pigeonholed same with me with the dog toys yeah and um it was something that i was very conscious of but and something that i worried about but in retrospect probably not worth it to worry about like yeah i i think that given the effort you, you can always like break out of, of something that you consider to be pigeonholed in. And I also don't necessarily feel like, I mean, you know, I, I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing. If this is the industry that you want to get into, like, why not? Yeah. If you, if you have, so you have a bike project. I don't know what the other bike project is. Maybe it's a full bike, like, you know, if this can be more of a of a detail exploration and it's a material a, exploration. I bet it's a bike light. <laughs> if I had a bet money on it. Maybe. It's a but, very very much a school project, I think. So I, I don't I don't think that you'll pigeonhole yourself. Like here's here's the thing is like nobody's gonna look through your portfolio and be like half of this is bikes. Yeah. I think also you know, there just because you do a bike specific part doesn't mean it can't relate to another object right Right. like a bike handlebar could be like in correlation with maybe like a handlebar that you know someone's looking to create for uh, a medical equipment you Mm -hmm. know like there there are overlaps of industries and you know when you nail down to that really nitty-gritty of a project you can still see the design process there yeah yeah i i just don't i don't think i mean a portfolio what a portfolio should really do is show your full skill set and 
I don't really care what how you're showing that. Like I I don't really I don't really care what projects you're using to show that as long as you're showing that. Yeah. And um I also just think that with a thesis project you should always investigate something that you know you will like be so interested in that you want to like really investigate. I definitely agree. Yeah, for your thesis, I think we also mentioned this on one of the podcasts, but the thesis is like your thing. Mm-hmm. Like you get to do what you want to do. Right. So just do what you love. Yeah. And or, or, yeah. Yeah. Do what you're passionate about. I know you got you had the your reservations on the <laughs> do what you love thing, but yeah. But I, I I think that yeah, as long as you're investigating something you're interested in, it's going to be a good project, and it doesn't doesn't matter what the ratio of bike projects to other projects are in your portfolio. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Next question. Next question. Just keep it going. We got a lot to get through. <laughs> okay. This comes from Aditya, and uh, they are at A D I Z E U S. Um, and they ask, "What do you think about the transferability of skill slash thinking and process from one design branch into another?" How does it affect the result? For example, a transportation designer doing products or fashion or any other way. Hmm. Interesting. So so how easily do different skills translate over to different industries? I mean, there's a lot of design industries. Like, I mean, if we want to start talking about like graphic design or accessory design, mm-hmm. I mean, those are those are valid design industries. I I've always been under the assumption that design is design is design. Mm-hmm. You know, once you learn to design process, it's the the thought process of design is all the same across all the industries, right? Like, you know, you have a you have a problem or some sort of product that you have to design, and you research, and you ideate, and you refine, and you prototype, and test, and come up with the final product. Um, I mean, also, I don't know how much I think fashion is a little bit off of that a branch off of that uh but i mean when you think about like graphic design Mm -hmm. i mean i feel like i'm confident enough to do a logo right granted i i am i usually don't do logos just because it's not what i like to do but (laughs) i could design a good logo right i think that i think that there's certainly a frame that i put things through that I don't necessarily think a graphic designer would put things through when they're approaching a project. And mm. and I have no basis for this other than just like the thoughts that I've had about this very topic, which is if I were doing a logo or any like especially a logo, I would almost I would almost think of the 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 elements as like components. Like I would I would almost think about it in a more three-dimensional way oh that's interesting um than than a graphic well i and this is yeah this is my speculation um i think that there's just like a different way of maybe thinking about the the project and i've worked with people who are ex transportation designers or went to school for transportation design but ended up in product design do you do you think there's a certain like flair that they bring i mean yeah. I'm, I'm definitely thinking about transportation design coming into industrial and how i i you know transportation design is a lot of styling right so i feel like when they come into product design they tend to do styling on products mm-hmm. that may or may not need styling yeah I, I don't know yeah i mean the i will say that the people that i have have worked with who are of that background are some of the most impressive designers I've ever met because, you know. So it was good. They, good yeah, experience. very good. Okay. Not only can they sketch their butts off and make really impressive digital sketches, and but they're like, because they have that interest in industrial design, they are so interested in like the nuts and bolts and like how things come together. So you... I, I don't know. I almost, I almost feel like in my experience, you get the best of both worlds and you get you get that look that you want like out of the out of the design because I've worked on teams with them but they also know how to assemble it to get the look right because mm, that's interesting because an assembly because cars are really complex yeah 
an assembly can completely ruin the vibe of your design yeah. if you don't understand how to how to make the best the best of that assembly to accentuate the styling hmm. um so i i have nothing but good things to say about um yeah transportation designers uh i think there's a lot of transferability um i don't know about i i wonder about graphic to industrial to industrial i think you end up getting a lot more uh i don't know Where, do you have any experience with that honestly i i've never really heard about I, I don't I don't know anyone personally that's gone from graphic to industrial. There's definitely been industrial to UX. Yeah. Um I mean that's a very common thing. Right. I guess packaging like you know people who who specialize in packaging design yeah, I, and... I would I would say the graphic to industrial jump is graphic to packaging. Right. Typically that's what I've seen. Cuz cuz graphic design and industrial are they're they're pretty divergent, you know. They're kind of out here whereas UX is much closer to industrial. Right. I, 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 I don't know. UX is maybe in the middle. Maybe. I wonder I wonder how much... Because I've watched like the Skillshare videos with Aaron Draplin, the graphic designer. And yeah. he does a lot of sketching. I, I wonder how much sketching the typical graphic designer does. We should probably... We should get a graphic designer on here to ask, her, ask them all these questions. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I definitely know a lot of my graphic design friends sketch. So... That's awesome. Actually, this... The whole bottom floor of this house is graphic designers. Really? Yeah, they're all they're all from Ireland. I I guess I could see like a graphic designer in approaching industrial design would really be focused on like the profiles, like and really refining the profiles of something. Um, yeah, maybe they would think about the negative space. Yeah, I I wonder. We hmm. should we should definitely. That'd be good. That'd be good to get on the pod. Sometimes. Yeah, I think so. But I think. Uh, yeah. That's all we can give to that question. That was a good question. Thank you. Um, and next question we have from Kevin. And Kevin says, have you ever proposed equity options or a percentage of a product slash company's profits based on the work that's expected? If so, uh, when slash how would you dictate and handle that type of scenario? Um, I, I think I pulled this question out because I... Th- I am definitely very interested in the royalty equity model of design, um, and I've certainly dabbled in it a good bit. I haven't gotten a royalty yet. Mm. Um, certainly tried tried many times, and you know the the thing with royalties. You know when you when you design a product, um, th- there's a lot of different scenarios. I mean, so so some of the scenarios that I've had is. You know, there are companies that you can just freely submit designs to. Mm. Um, you know, you think about furniture companies or or toy companies where inventors come in or designers come in and they say, hey, you know, we, I've been thinking about your brand and I also have this idea that I want to uh, develop. And designers, a lot of times, don't really have the resources to just like outright manufacture a chair. Um, you know, some designers t- choose that route, but... Um, you know, you license your design to these big companies and the companies say, oh yeah, this is great. You know, we'll pay you 5% royalty. Mm. Um, and that happens with inventors and designers across the board. Uh, the, the issue is, is that, you know, 90% of the time you have to develop those things on your own unpaid, right? Right. You have to come up with ideas. You have to create a presentation and, you know, possibly a prototype and maybe even a patent pending, depending on the product. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's obviously time and cost uh, intensive, so it's not easy. Um, but the payoffs could be huge. Think about right. think about the guy who designed the pet rock. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Full if, circle. Bring it back. <laughs> oh, every two episodes, two or three episodes. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting model, and it's something that, is definitely I've been looking for a situation like this or or a company to engage with that would that would be interested in this type of relationship. It's uh it's definitely if it all goes well, 
it is the one that pays back the most. Right, yeah, it's, it's high risk, high reward. Yeah, exactly. Right? Another model that I heard of recently, and I was actually, it was Derek J. Elliott, Mr. Helicopter Animator. Oh, okay. Who uh, told me about this was uh, was like, instead of, instead of royalty, instead of working hourly, instead of quoting project, value-based quoting, mm. which is... Like, this is the value that I can bring. Like, this is, and and here is, here's the monetary, you know, here's how I place that monetarily. Right. Um, which is a completely different way. And it's more based on like, yeah, like, it's not about the amount of time that it takes me, but about the amount of value that I can provide for your company by designing this product for you. Right. Like maybe it's if you're designing something for Apple, obviously you can price it much higher because, you know, they they would value your work a lot more. But it's more about it's more like because I can complete this in less time and provide you with a better product than, say, other freelancers or other contractors my value is therefore much greater than any of theirs. Right, yeah, because it, it, it doesn't make any sense to price your, like, if you, could, if you are such a good graphic designer that you can design a logo in two hours, but that logo is amazing, Right. that doesn't make any sense to price yourself at, you know, 200 bucks. Like yeah, that you know, it doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. And And I hope I'm representing this accurately and... But but I thought it was a really interesting yeah. alternative. I, I have dabbled in that a little bit. I've also like mixed value pricing into hourly a little bit right. as well, like just double checking myself. Yeah. And then um, an, another thing that uh, you mean you think about startups, um, where if you get in early, occasionally they offer equity to the employees. Right. And some bigger companies offer equity to employees, like stock options and things like that. Um, and then another thing that I've been working on, and this is a pretty rare scenario, but you know, occasionally if you, if you get a, a good working relationship with a client, um, you can do like a split royalty. Mm. So where that, what that means is instead of, you know, taking a, a seven, eight percent royalty, you can like drop it down to five or four and also get a little bit of money up front right so like a you know charge a design fee that is a lot less than you would normally charge but you also get a royalty so it's like it's kind of like the best of both worlds um so yeah if nothing ends up happening at least you i got a little cash right right and if something doesn't end up happening like hey awesome like this is great yeah um but yeah kevin like i i've definitely been interested in that and something i want to explore more I'll be excited if I ever get a royalty. That'll be I fun. I know. <laughs> You'll right? see me in the Bahamas. <laughs> James, I don't know if that royalties pay that much. But Come on. If you make it big time, like the pet rock guy. I, I'm not I'm not saying it's a five-star resort. I'm just saying that I'll be in the Bahamas. I will say the pet, the pet industry, I have all the connections, and all I need is just people to, like, come up with ideas, and we can collaborate. We can make, We can get some royalty cash. Oh, I just don't have time to make pet products because I've just done too many of them. Fair enough. Shall we move on? We should move on. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the uh, for the question. Uh, this next question comes from Connor McIlveen. McIlveen? Mc- McIlveen. Oh, boy. Hopefully it's McIlveen. Shout out to Connor. Uh, shout out. Um, at Connor underscore McIlveen. His question is, how do we manage our side projects? That's a good question. I I don't know. I I think <laughs> you don't know. Well, 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 it was really easy when I was working full time in Texas because there was the the five o'clock off switch, right? Which meant from eight to five, you make you make money and then you go home, and now you get to work on your side projects. Yeah, so that was easy, right? But now it's a, a lot more mixed into my actual work which is which is hard because sometimes like i'm just like doing side projects all the time because that's what you yeah. want to do you never want to do the client work do you miss those days do you miss the days of the nine to eight to five there there halt? there is something that is nice about having that definitive like 
structured day for one and then also not having to worry about the next paycheck right you know like not having to worry about like oh you know i haven't had a job in you know a month or so and you know it uh, what's the next lineup going to be of of work or or also the opposite of that like oh i have way too much work and i don't even have time for free uh for side projects right so i mean it's a it's a different scenario nowadays and i don't have a good answer i don't i, I think i just kind of do it as i feel I don't know. yeah yeah i mean that's the thing is like i i pretty much function that the side projects just I work on them when I can. Like, you know, I I also take on a lot of freelance work and sometimes it's hard to get around to the side projects. One thing that I have been doing recently is using the that Google Calendar. I've been I've been making a schedule for myself. Oh, how so? Like you you literally make a daily schedule of, "Hey, here's my working hours at this freelance gig." Yeah. And then here's a an, uh, few hours I'm going to work on this thing. Yeah, I was getting a bit overwhelmed um, because of, you know, just a couple different um, freelance projects. And I really needed to just like see what my day was and Mm. block out items so that I didn't feel like, oh, gosh, like when can I even get to that? It's like, okay, let's let's just like estimate how long, you know, I need to work on this and then see. and, And it actually I have found it to be very cathartic and and also putting things into perspective of oh i have i have enough time for all these things and as long as i just like plan it for the next day i like i don't like planning things day of if you can plan things the day before for mm-hmm. the next day that's good like, then you can just wake up and like get to it i i need to try that out I mean, my my workflow right scenario now is just like posting notes on a wall, like <laughs> like we I think we talked about it last episode. Like I just have written down my things I need to do, right? And just put them on the wall, right? But yeah. I like your planning out idea. Yeah, I mean, I got this from uh, Jocko Willink, who's uh, he's a podcaster. He's like a Navy SEAL, and he's written all these books. One of them is oh, Discipline we, Equals Freedom, or I think, was, something like was that. Was he on Casey Neistat? Yeah, he was on okay. Casey Neistat. I saw that video. Um, but yeah, he's all about like, make the plan for the next day, the, the day, like the night before also pack your gym bag the night before so that you just like go to the gym. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to get into that mode of just being a little bit more proactive because for me, there's nothing worse than waking up and just being like, okay, so what am I doing today? (laughs) And that, that's a thing too, especially when you're freelancing on your own. So, uh, I don't know that I think when it comes to side projects, if you can, if you can try and schedule in like, uh, like if you want to get going on something, just try and, and put in that time, like, you know, put that block that time out in your schedule and say like, here's what I'm going to work on it. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good, uh, good advice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for sending in Connor. Uh, next one we have NC tiny hiker and they asked, <laughs> What? Just that handle name. Okay, let me let me quick do a quick little tangent here. So at NC Tiny Hiker on <laughs> on on Instagram. So yeah. this is actually my f- high school friend. Okay. Uh, he's not a designer. Right. Um, North Carolina Tiny Hiker. Yeah. So like, ap- okay. He he hiked the Appalachian Trail. He, wow. He's hiked the. Is he tiny? And, How tiny is he? Uh, I don't think he's that tiny. He's probably like, like my size. Okay. Um. And uh, he is a trucker, and he has built his own tiny house in the North Carolina, ah, North Carolina mountains. Tiny hiker. Oh, that's what it is. Tiny house. Tiny hiker. Okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. I didn't make the connection. Maybe that even, I don't even know if that is the connection. It was funny. Like, we went to school together, and, you know, you know, high school is such a weird place because there's all these kind of cliques, and, you know, you have the popular kids, you have the, the jocks, you have, like, the people that you know, or or goss or whatever. And then you have like, there are some people that go through high school and they just kind of go unnoticed. And I won't say that like NC Tiny Hacker went unnoticed, but he was not, he wasn't like a popular kid, Mm. but I was good friends with him because I was an art, art class. And like, you know, we were just, what click were you in Nick? I was kind of like dabbling in all of them. Me too. Yeah. I, I wonder if all designers are, are like floaters. I, I used to go from group to group. Yeah. 
but but NC Tiny Hiker, he was a fun, crazy kind of guy. Yeah. And it's just great to see him living the best life now on Instagram because right. he just like he's built this tiny house. He's always making things and doing crazy things. Yeah. And I just think back about like the, like the valedictorian of my high school, like oh. I, they're probably an accountant now, like just doing right. the, doing the nine to five. And right. NC Tiny Hackers out there living his life. Yeah, and I'm just like, you go, man. That's awesome. Um. Anyways, sorry, so, sorry for that tangent, but just had I to, love your handle name. Just had to uh, shout shout NC Tiny Hacker out, and they say what what good are design ideas if you're not good at marketing them or making them lucrative? Oh man, this is kind of like. Is good design, does good design need to be marketed? Well, it depends on what, like, how big the company is that you're working for. Mm. Because, like, if Microsoft or Apple releases a, a product, like, if it's good enough, yeah, maybe they don't need to market it that much. Right. But if you're just starting out, like... I mean, unless you get picked up by blogs and things like that. But like, that, but that's the thing, though. Like, if your design is that groundbreaking, you're going to get picked up by blogs, right? You would think. Perhaps. I mean, I, I, I did a student project that got knocked off. Yeah. We've talked about that. I think, I think there's a lot of factors that go into that, though. It's a Be lot of random factors, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and, and kind of like first and foremost is the communication of your idea to the public. Like in terms of, you know, your portfolio, like obviously, Nick, you you've kind of you you've kind of mastered the art of the portfolio piece on mm. Behance, I would say. Like yeah. you've you've spent a lot of time tweaking that, making it optimized. Yeah, right? there's there's yeah, I mean I have we've talked about Behance. We had that portfolio episode. That was a yeah. good episode. But uh but there are a lot of people out there that might have really great ideas, but they don't communicate them very well. Mm. And so they don't get picked up by the blogs or, mm. you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong with advertising, reaching a bigger demographic, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, what good are design ideas if you're not good at marketing? Them? I, I will say, I, I kind of feel that you can take, so I feel like, amazing designs kind of market themselves right like like it's just like whoa i've seen that product and somehow people pick it up they start talking about it, they start sharing it you know everyone has a fidget spinner now right okay so <laughs> <laughs> right you, you know okay but i also think that if you have a good design you can market that and really it, like if you push behind it i think about like watch brands mm -hmm. you know watches generally are kind of all the same especially nowadays everyone has their boutique watch brand everyone's like making a little fancy you know like oh like, i made a little designer watch look at it right <laughs> and it's the people who market it well and really build a story behind it that creates a good brand a good yeah. design yeah i mean i i so i feel like i i i'm i'm a little at odds with what you're saying right now okay which is like I don't just think that good design is just going to get like picked up. I think that No, I'm like, I'm talking about like amazing great design. Like so something that you just like and are wowed by. Like I think about all of Nendo's work. Uh-huh. You know, Nendo always has that really interesting, clever, innovative things. Yeah, but Nendo also does a really good job of communicating it and art directing all of the photography. Uh, okay, so you're saying you're saying their great design, they all they they have the both uh, both sides they have the great design and then they also market that yeah with the photography and the graphics it has to be a holistic vision or else the whole thing falls apart that that is true like i i will agree that if you have a great design and you take horrible photos of it and never really post online maybe post on a tumblr or something never gonna happen yeah R recently i watched i watched the very first alien movie i think for like the first time in my life all the way through and i watched some behind the scenes stuff and they were showing the guy who wrote the script and they were interviewing him. And he was just like, it. the way that he was describing the script, it was like, they barely took anything from his script. <laughs> like, like if he had, if he had gone to a worse director than Ridley Scott, that movie would gone, would have gone completely unnoticed. 
But Ridley Scott picked it up. It becomes like it becomes something even more than just like a sci-fi and a horror movie and becomes something greater than that initial thing. I and and you know, vice versa. I'm I'm sure that there's examples of great scripts for movies, great ideas for products that just don't get executed well. There's so many points in the the life of a product where the whole thing can fall off the rails. That is so true. I mean, that's a whole other th- like idea of, I mean, ideas are worthless. Mm-hmm. It's about the execution. Right. Everyone has ideas, and some ideas are great, some ideas are bad, but yeah, it's, it's what you do with them. But but uh, maybe we're not getting to the meat of of Tiny Hiker's question, which is what good are design ideas if you're not good at marketing them? Like... I mean, obviously, in our day-to-day lives, we are working for other people, like, a lot. We, you know, we're working on our own individual designs and and our own individual brands, but we're also working for other people and their brands. And we don't have control over that end in marketing. But we do, you know, we do provide them with the best ideas that we have to offer, and that makes us hireable that makes us continue to get hired uh you know i think that not everybody is going to be a design entrepreneur some people are supporting players and supporting players are are absolutely necessary and crucial to come to a lot of companies success right like johnny ive is not an entrepreneur he's like he i mean i wouldn't say he's a supporting player either although maybe he is but he's he's something else that's true that's true you know but he's he's like he's got great ideas he's not gonna take them and go i don't know maybe he would start his own company i'd buy <laughs> i'd buy from johnny i've well you're gonna buy that new ring didn't johnny and mark make a new ring did they yeah they made that like diamond ring that's all diamond no metal it's just one solid chunk of diamond that they hollowed out so you can put your finger through it <sighs> man it's extravagant. Can you like? Can you just imagine being a fly on the wall in the brainstorms of like Johnny Ive and Mark Newson? That would just be uh, what I would give. I would pay. I'd pay a lot of money for those club box seats. Yeah, that'd be amazing. But anyway, I I, th- I think we got. I think we finally got to the yeah. core of Tiny Hiker's question. Yeah. Thanks for sending in NC Tiny Hiker. Um, what, what's next? What we got? We got jackb.pd and they ask what's the one piece of advice you'd give your younger designer self hmm nick my younger designer self i'm going to take this as i i kind of feel like we've done like a uh, what do you wish you knew in school so i'm going to take this back to to when i graduated take it back a couple years right so you know when i when i started at petmate I think my my younger designer self, I think I would have I would have pushed I, I would have told myself to to uh, push push the boundaries of what what I could do in the company mm. in terms of like I maybe like grab more. Yeah. Grab more things, like put more on my plate. I think when I started working full time it was it was amazing because hey I, I get to work on real products that are going to get manufactured and you know when you get your first manufactured product that's amazing um but i think i could have i could have taken on more like i think i remember like starting work and being like oh thank goodness this isn't school anymore i don't have to like this is this is a lot easier like i can kind of sit back and relax a little bit <laughs> but i actually kind of think i like now that i think back about it i think there's opportunity to kind of reach on beyond that and be like hey i mean i can design these dog toys but also what about the branding like right do we need to update the branding can i help with that yeah i think that's what i would have reached for more hmm that's interesting yeah i guess i could echo that sentiment about my first job is like i i would say to myself don't listen to all these jaded designers who are who are working here like this Mm. is an awesome awesome opportunity like you have a lot of control over what's going on and uh don't let a committee don't let a committee of other designers design your work like there are some projects from my first job 
where I'm I'm like I will never put them in my portfolio. I don't know that I'll ever admit <laughs> to them because it was such a design by committee of yeah. of just like listening to too many people. Mm. There's there's a there's there's some sort of I, I don't know what the what what that graph looks like, but there's there's a point at which asking for feedback just like starts to drop off. Starts to drop off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and be detrimental to your final product. I agree. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to like trust yourself or just find one person to trust. Yeah. Like Yeah. Have we ever talked about the litter box I designed that that the committee decided that it should be poop brown so that it would hide the poop. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that was that's another story for another day. Yeah, it was unfortunately, a unfortunately, mine was not color related but form related, and so that is indelible throughout time. Uh, but I'm yeah, sorry, Jay. no, it's okay, it's all right. But you know, like these are the great thing is is that you. We're now in this position to look back and reflect on these things. And it's like, it's it's a really satisfying feeling to be where we are right now once we've gone through all of that and all of the things that we've learned. Because like, I mean, the thing is about your younger self is that you can never predict where your older self is going to end up. Yep. Mm-hmm. And... I'm very thankful for where my older self has ended up through all of this because I was really panicked back at my old job. Mm -hmm. Um, Going back to that first question about pigeonholing, I was really panicked. I, if you had told me back then what I would be doing now, I, I would, I would be like, great. That sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really happy that that's where it all ended up. Yeah. We got to get some back to the future get the DeLorean out. Yeah. (laughs) Be interesting. Like, would you ever give advice to your older designer self? (laughs) Nobody ever talks about that. (laughs) I don't think so. Right. Cause you would know, right? That's weird. I guess. I don't know. But anyway, go to go into the future to tell yourself something. You never go. In, you would never go into the future to tell yourself something. That's right. That's the whole point of Back to the Future no, Two. No, back. They're going back. Oh, Back to the Future Two. Yeah, they go. They is go that where they went into the future? Did they, did they go to the Western one in that one, or is that the third? That's one? the third one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but anyway, thank you for the question, Jack. That was uh, that. There was a lot to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, next question comes from Sem Duranet. Uh, I'm probably mi- mispronouncing that. I apologize. But they ask, I, I think they had a few questions and I, I'm also not sure if, um, I, I kind of rewrote it just to, to, to clarify, but they ask essentially, um, I'm not the best at sketching, but I am proficient at CAD. Is it necessary to be good at sketching, to be a designer? Hmm. So, so I, I've also run into this question a couple of times. Um, I think even on my live stream where, you know, there there are designers out there that maybe aren't the best sketchers and they can still convey their idea via sketch but you know they they actually you know they are really proficient in CAD and create amazing final designs yeah and is is it okay if you can't sketch amazing listen up sim get yourself a vr headset Get That's yourself true. some gravity sketch. That's true. And go wild. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that gravity sketch is going to democratize sketching. A, yeah, a good bit. I I won't say it's going to. It actually might. I think it might actually. You know, when you, when you think about democratizing design, it's it's kind of like a a looming thing in the back of your head. Like, oh, is is everyone going to become a designer now? Like, if everyone can sketch in perspective, is everyone just going to come up with ideas? I think it actually might be the opposite. Like it's actually going to distill the crowd. It's if it's actually going to flatten the playing field. Like, mm. oh, there's a there's a lot of great sketchers out there, but guess what? Now that everyone's using this is you know 50 years in the future, right? Right. Now that everyone's using now that everyone's sketching and, and living in VR, um, the actual the designers who are actually making nice nicely composed forms and and great designs are going to stand out from right. other people who can make designs, yeah, but they're not actually aesthetically pleasing because the balance is not right or the composition's right. incorrect. 
Yeah, I think the only thing about being proficient in CAD versus sketching is just speed. Like, yeah, that's that's your biggest hurdle, right? Because is CAD is slow. The person next to you who's the better sketcher is just going to get their ideas reviewed much more quickly than you are. Yeah, and it's also a numbers game. If you yeah. can, if you can pump out a hundred ideas, the odds of you having one good idea is much better than five CAD ideas and right. one one of them is going to be good. But in a vacuum, like being, it it does not like equate being a good designer, being a good sketcher, or a good sketcher, good designer. Like you, I'm sure that, you know, maybe you are a, a really good designer that's just specifically proficient in CAD. Like, I don't think it excludes you from being a good designer. Like that, that doesn't seem, there's no logic to that really. Yeah. I, I, I will say, I think that you should, be at least proficient in communicating your ideas in an effective way. Right. Um, and preferably that that is with some sort of 2D sketching medium in today's a, day and age. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, if you are proficient in CAD, then use that CAD as an underlay for digital sketching. That's a good like, point, too. That's you know, a good point. Uh, you know, Reed in the last podcast talked about using crude models for for sketching oh, as like, a reference yeah if you came in cad hot glue stuff together take a photo yeah but uh i think like if if it's perspective that has got you hung up then just like yeah use that cad use use the cad skills you have because i imagine if you're proficient at cad you can probably quickly rough up something that could be a good reference for um for sketching over yeah anyway yeah thanks for sending it in sam all right, what we got next? We got Sean Baldwin. Uh, and he oh, says, Sean's got a good question here. Oh. It's pretty long. Okay. It's okay. Calm down, James. It's okay. It's not that long. It's not that long. <sighs> I graduated in 2016 and got my bachelor's degree in industrial design. After applying for several jobs and not getting hired, I, om- I lost the motivation to do design and got a different job. Now that I have this job... I'm actually more motivated to get back into design. However, all I have is my laptop, pencils, and paper, not enough space and money to build prototypes. My experience or knowledge of manufacturing is only what I learned at school or online. What do you know about freelancing sites like Upwork? Do clients hire for just doing sketches and CAD? Hmm. I think there's a lot to this question um yeah that's i mean what's your initial thoughts well i mean my my initial thoughts is, is like this is actually i mean this this is good that we had this question on here because there are scenarios where people graduate with industrial design and they can't get a job and they have to get the the other the other thing whatever that is you know maybe it's some sort of prototyping gig or model shop thing i don't know um and and yeah, I, I, I'm glad that they're actually getting motivated again to get back into design. Right. And my initial thoughts are that, yes, you can still do design work without having a full model shop and being able to build things. Um, there's no questions about that. I think the question is is more about the experience. You know, they, they, the, they're asking, do clients hire just for sketches and CAD? Certainly. But they only know about manufacturing in their schooling, and and I don't know how much manufacturing you learned in your schooling career, but you know I think we had a, two classes on it. But I will mm-hmm. say that that is dwarfed immensely by at least like the first year of working full time in the industry. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, here's one of those situations where if you're really unhappy with your current gig. And you really want a design job, look for those design internships. Look for like a fall, spring internship. That's a good that is a good advice too. You know, I it's it's unfortunate that that, that would be the way that you would need to get in, like unless you really start to work on your portfolio. I mean, I read the sentence about laptop pencils, paper. I'm like, what else do you need? Like that is what we use. I yeah. mean, we have a three D printer. But I, I mean, but you could do it without you could. Yeah, I, I think about, um, I, I mean, I personally, 
on some projects never use a 3d printer i just right. take paper and tape it together and cut yeah. it up you know cardboard foam core right i um i think you know i i don't want to sound harsh but i but i feel like if you if you want it go get it like that's like true. you have you you do have all the materials that you need yeah like my my whole ethos that you know i i garnered along the way is just about designing with the things that you have around you like i do all my rendering on my phone yeah like the these are these are not things these are not barriers to entry you just have to think about like the lessons that you learned in design school and being resourceful which is to me the quality that is first and foremost for any industrial designer that's true and just make it happen and, and i even think nowadays it's even better because this instagram community is even more motivating there you can yeah. see people doing things and you can you know you know push yourself to to create and do these side projects and i guarantee you uh that you know whatever your whatever your job is currently you're probably not working like 16 hour days yeah there's probably at least two or three hours in there where you can squeeze in some sort of side project or other job um and in terms of freelancing sites like upwork i mean i don't have any experience with that but i will say that it, the it's like uh i don't know a good analogy but it, it, you know it's like if you're if your car broke down like the engine just busted up and you go to fix the tire like no, you need to do the great design work first, and then the clients will come, right? Mm. Like that, that, like that, that, like you don't put the cart before the horse. I think, in my opinion, right? Mm. I don't know. I that's my I th opinion. I think that's my experience. Right. I right. think um, I wouldn't eliminate anything at this point necessarily. If you can get a freelance gig, yeah, more power to you. Yeah, because like you know, for instance, when I came to the city. And uh, I was single. I got on those dating apps. And everybody was like, what are you doing with those dating apps? You know, it's like at the at the time when I was starting to date in New York City, like dating apps were just mm. becoming a thing. Okay, so you think you're at the time, like online freelancing websites are not really that cool. Right. But maybe but they could be the norm. They could in be a the couple norm. years. That's true. That's true. Um, but yeah, I you know, Sean, I don't know you. I I don't know anything about you, but I think you got it. Like if you have the fire to like want to improve your situation, which clearly you do, then you have the fire to make it happen. Go do it, Sean. Do it. But uh thank you for the question. I think that's all the time we have yeah. for questions. Um and we we do really appreciate everyone sending in questions and you know, we couldn't get to all of them. We wish we could. And keep sending them if you have them. Um, Mighty Details Podcast at gmail.com. And we always like to shout out someone that's doing interesting things on Instagram every week. Oh, yeah. And this week we wanted to shout out Pierce. And that is at Pierce, but in between each letter is an underscore. So P underscore E underscore, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll link to him. Um, he, he's an illustrator, I guess, right? I, I think so. Uh, Let's see. He he does really unique illustrations. I mean... Concept I, artist at... Oh. He's a concept artist at Weta Workshop, which okay. is... I mean, that's Peter Jackson. I, I, I'm pretty sure that's Peter Jackson's, like, as in Lord of the Rings. Oh. Uh, that, okay. that workshop. I know Lord of the Rings. I'm pretty sure. I've heard of it. Unless I'm mistaken. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. They did all the concept art for Lord of the Rings and everything like that. But yeah, yeah. I think his, his most recent one was motorcycles, but I mean, scroll back cause there's a ton of stuff. Yeah. There's some great stuff. The, the motorcycle project is amazing. Uh, motorcycles for people in all sorts of different positions, <laughs> riding positions that you never considered before for a motorcycle. It's like the Karma Sutra of motorcycle riding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, go check them out. It's pretty funny stuff, but also there's a lot of talent behind there. Um, and then, of course, just a reminder, we 
had the survey again, right. please, please take a moment and do that. And, you know, you will be entered into a raffle for the Ben Mir. Um, and subscribe on iTunes, uh, Google Play, Spotify, uh, of course, the YouTube. Got to watch that YouTube. Come on. Got to he- see those hype sneakers, those <laughs> nas- massive bands, you know? Yeah, dude. Um, and, yeah, as always, uh, I'm at Nick P. Baker. And I'm at I Draw and Receipts. See you. Later.